Hi, y'all. I'm Emily Gibson, co-founder of ATX Television Festival. And I'm Jennifer Morgan, director of programming. And you're watching ATX TV Festival season 10. And you already know how I feel about this one. It's special for a lot of reasons. And that it is. It was a show that you and I bonded over when it was still the early days. And to say we've been anxious to get this group back together would be an understatement. Carter can definitely vouch for that. As a queer kid in the South who was obsessed with TV, there just were not a lot of shows like this when I was growing up. Then I graduated, moved to Austin, AKA a blue oasis in the Red Sea of Texas, as Karma would say. And well, I married my best girlfriend. Okay, I'm starting to see why this show hit home. Just a little bit. But now we're here, ready to celebrate the Amy's, Karma's, Shane's, and Lauren's of the world with one of our personal favorite humans, executive producer and showrunner Cardi T Carter Covington in this amazing cast. And get a little nostalgic as we tend to do. We do indeed. One more thing before we get started. If you're watching the festival premiere of this panel right now, tweet about it. Hashtag faking it, hashtag TV for all. The algorithm is a thing and the internet makes things happen sometimes. So we hear. Army, army, we're looking at you. <laughs> so without further ado, let's get this reunion rolling and hand it over to our moderator and fellow Faking It fan, TV Guide Magazine's Jim Halterman. Hi, Jim. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me for this conversation. I love it. We're so excited. Well, we're going to get out of the way and let you get started. All right. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start this panel with three little words, let's be lesbians. That was spoken in the pilot episode in 2014 of the series that would make us laugh, wipe a few tears, and also educate us on a lot of things that maybe we didn't know much about. Of course, I'm talking about faking it, which we're paying tribute to today during season 10 of the ATX Television Festival. Um, I'm Jim Halterman, West Coast Bureau Chief of TV Guide Magazine. And Faking It was a groundbreaking series that ran for three seasons on MTV. And when I rewatched some episodes recently, the biggest takeaway for me was how much I missed the series and also talking to all these wonderful people in front of and behind the camera. So it was a very quick yes when they asked me to moderate. So as, as we heard, if you were watching this, hashtag TV for all and hashtag Faking It. Now let's get the reunion going. First up, he helped develop the series when it came live on MTV. Please welcome executive producer Carter Covington. Hi, Jim. There he is. Hi. She brought bright-eyed and optimistic Karma Ashcroft to life. Please welcome Katie Stevens. Hi. Hey, it worked. <laughs> Pretending to be a lesbian started an unexpected floodgate of big changes for Karma's bestie, Amy Ruddenfeld. Please welcome Rita Volk. There she is. Hi. <laughs> and he was not only the most popular student at Hester High, but Shane Harvey was a welcome breath of fresh air for just embracing who he was 100%. Please welcome Michael Willett. Hello. There he is. <laughs> I love it when that works. And we all actually come up when we're supposed to and pop up on stage. <laughs> it's like magic. Magic. Um, before we get going, there's somebody who could not join us today. Um, so Greg Sulkin actually recorded a little video for us. So let's play that right now. Throw it to Greg. Hi guys, it's Greg here. Just wanted to say hello. I'm so bummed I can't be there today. But first off, just want to say hello to the cast. I love you guys. I miss you guys. Uh, and secondly, just want to say hello to you guys. Thank you so much for supporting Faking It. Uh, I had an absolute, absolute blast doing the show. Um, it was so much fun. Thank you, Mr. Carter Covington, for the opportunity. I definitely left that show a more educated human being, so thank you. Um, and thank you to all you guys out there for watching the show. It's a show I feel that needs to be put on every TV screen because I think it's important. Um, and just want to say I miss everybody involved with the show. Thank you, guys. I love you guys. And uh, have a very health, healthy and happy and safe rest of 2021. Oh, it's so sweet. Oh, <laughs> Yay. I love him. It, felt, it felt like he was here, didn't it? Um, Thanks, Greg. What a so, sweet. <laughs> so, Carter, let, let's let's start at the beginning. Um, talk about just developing the show, which which there was, it was so groundbreaking watching it. But tell us about getting it off the ground and actually getting it on the air. Sure. Um, so, uh, faking it. Um, MTV reached out to me and a couple of other writers uh, in early 2013 because um, they had been pitched this idea about two girls pretending to be lesbians in order to be cool, uh, in order for guys to like them and 
things like that. And they were looking to sort of, they liked the idea, but wanted to find new writers to redevelop it with. And um, I pitched them the idea that, that this of Hester High and that these two girls uh, would um, go on this journey together where one of them would realize she had feelings for her best friend and it would get really complicated. And MTV really liked that. And so I wrote it very quickly. I wrote the pilot very quickly. My son had just been born. I was like, ah, I'm exhausted. And, and, uh, and then they greenlit it, the pilot very quickly. We cast these wonderful people and it, we were in production that fall. I mean, it happened very, very fast. I think they were uh, excited and, and I'm still kind of pinching myself that uh, all that happened. It's kind of been magical and it's definitely been, I miss it every day. I miss this show every day. I miss working with these amazingly talented people every day and um and i hope they remember it as fondly as i do we okay do. katie i'll start i'll start with you what what do you remember about getting the role of karma and then just kind of understanding who she was right off the bat was it something you kind of got her right away um no <laughs> i um <laughs> i remember going to the audition and um i had gotten the audition that day i had friends in town I got a call from my agent being like, we have this audition for you. It's in two hours. If you could be memorized, that would be great. Um, I like borrowed a friend's shirt because mine ripped in the car and it was like not right for karma at all. <laughs> um, and I just went in and I did the audition. And I remember I was sitting next to a really beautiful girl in the waiting room. And I was like, she's gonna get this. She's beautiful and probably really talented. That person happened to be Rita. Um, and I remember I went in and the casting director was like, uh, can you hold on a second? And she- Katie's come outside. <laughs> yeah. She went outside and grabbed Carter. And it was, it was cool for me because I had been auditioning at that point for like three and a half years after having done American Idol and everything that I had heard from people was that I don't have anything else on my resume. So people don't trust that I could do the job. And Carter was the first person who looked at me and saw me for me and my ability to be able to do the role. And he didn't know that I was on American Idol because I guess he didn't look at my resume until like the second or third audition, he asked me a question about it. Um, and then, yeah, I tested and me and Rita both tested for Karma. And, you know, we had a really lovely moment. I remember in the audition room where we were like, you know, whoever is right for this is gonna get it. Like you're great and you're great and, you know, whoever gets it is going to get it. It's not a reflection of our talent. And then I remember I was sweating with nerves. Rita does an impression of me in the waiting room. Oh, yeah, this was, I mean, this was in the screen test and she and I were just sit sitting next to each other and we're, we're all really nervous. And there's like three of us in there with this other girl who's going in for Amy, who was just lovely. And, um, and I remember we were looking at her and she goes, is this your first time? And we're both just like, <laughs> yeah. She's like, yeah, I've done a couple of these. And you just turn to Katie and she's just going like this. <laughs> but just sweat marks on her shirt. <laughs> I was, I was and really, full. It's gonna be okay. And it was this little black box room. I mean, it was tiny, it was hot. Um, at that point, we, I still thought I was going in for, uh, for karma. Uh, and then this other girl who was auditioning for Amy came out and they were like already sending her home. So me and Rita looked at each other and we were like, oh my God, like they're making cuts already. Brutal. And then Rita got called out of the room and I was like, oh my God, what's happening? What's happening? Like full anxiety. And then she came back in and she was like, I'm reading for Amy. And they like gave her a second and then her and I, you know, I think it was great that we had already formed some sort of rapport through the auditioning process together. Cause then we read for Karma and Amy together and it was comfortable and, you know, made me not nervous being in there with somebody that I felt familiar with. Um, and then it was magic. And I, we found out maybe like an hour after we left and I got her phone number and that was it. That's amazing. Oh, so romantic. <laughs> it is. 
Rita, was, did, when, once you took on the role of Amy, did you kind of get her right away? Because she definitely goes on a whole different journey than Karma does in the series. No, I think everyone would agree that we did not, I did not get her right away. Um, I think it was a very, it was a hard subject. It was a touchy subject. And um, also, you know, I think going through the audition process, you get a, a sense over time of who you're going in for. And Amy was just kind of like thrown on me, you know, and, and then I found out, okay, you're Amy. And I was like, okay, and you know, what does this mean? And I remember being worried about it because I, you know, it was a very, I, I knew it was gonna be a very important character. And I knew that it was a character that I had to take on with responsibility, that we all had to take on with responsibility um, and kind of avoiding tropes and stereotypes of what she was supposed to be. And I think that was the hardest thing for me. And I remember Carter just, you know, cause Jamie Travis who directed the pilot, we were all just trying to figure it out. And this was my first time on a set. And this was my first like really real acting project you know i think it was everybody's and the conversation just kind of went to you know forget that she's in love with a girl forget that she's a girl just how would you act how would you be if you fell in love with your best friend and that was not reciprocated um and just go off of that you know and just just find the heart of that and then everything else will kind of fall into place and it did um it did and one thing I'm really grateful for, I think, is that we, I, I, if, I think if anything, if the show did anything, I, I think it was avoiding stereotypes. It, it had heart, it, it really did. And I, and I think it just came from that of just play it with the feeling, you know, and everything will just kind of come into place. And, and it did, yeah. So it, it took a second, but hopefully I think, I think we got there ultimately. Yeah, and Carter, what kind of conversations were you having with, with Katie and with Rita just about their relationship on the show and their friendship and everything? Well, you know, the pilot, if you, if everybody goes back and watches it, it is, we, Jamie and I pitched to the network, we wanted like an independent film aesthetic, like we wanted it to feel gritty and, and different. And, and, and uh, they were like, cool. And then when we turned in the pilot, they're like, yeah, but can everybody be really pretty? And um, so when they picked us up to series, that was kind of the only note and they wanted us to reshoot the teaser. So if you go back and watch the pilot, I don't know if anybody has done that in a while. I just did, I just did. The beginning of the pilot, it's like Rita's talking about how terrible she looks and she's got these like gorgeous <laughs> girls and like they just look lovely. And then as soon as it says faking it, it goes to what we shot for the pilot and everybody looks like independent film. Yeah. So we, we had like some growing pains with the sort of early process in every way. I mean, I think every show is like that. You kind of take some moment to find it. But but we knew, I remember the first day of shooting just being like, oh, this 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 is special. You know, this I've, I had shot enough to know like, oh, this is working. And it isn't just the script, it's like the actors and the, um, just the, the, whole, the whole enchilada was working. So okay. um, I think it was just a matter of fine tuning it. My, Michael, when this, you, yeah, yeah I just wanna say really quick, like I feel like from the like inception, the idea has potential to be very insensitive. And it was very masterful, I think, of Carter and the, the writers to to maneuver in a way that was genuine and uh, sensitive and respectful. And so that was something we were always dealing with. Um, so I, I feel pretty proud that the concept could have been tricky to say the least. And, and we came up with something that I think we're all pretty proud of. Yeah. yeah, and, and made, I made I, controversial choices. That yeah, fans didn't like at the time, but we kind of dared them to keep watching so we could go past them, and and that's what I really loved about the show that we really kind of um, kept the conversation going and wanted to really. I'm still a big believer that as queer people, that everybody's queer in their own way, and the more we can get past labels and just get to 
being feeling free to be and love who we are, that the better we'll all be. So I think faking its message still holds. And Amy was the torchbearer of that. Yeah, I think I think I loved it so much being an older gay because it made me think back to when I was much younger and I didn't have shows like this. And I didn't see a character like Shane on TV. So seeing that, I was just like, wow, this is going to make such a big impact to the young people out there now. And Michael, when you came on as Shane, like Shane just owned who he was, which we didn't see a lot of, especially with the teenage character, because teenagers are supposed to be still figuring themselves out. But Shane was kind of kind of along his journey already. But can you can you talk to that a little bit and how you understood him and you know just yeah happening? I yeah. I remember reading the breakdown for the character and it was like like the popular gay guy at school, which was rare because you don't see those words combined in that way <laughs> together. <laughs> the popular gay guy at high school, like that's not really a thing generally. And so I was like, oh, this is cool. Like this is, there was like a lot of wish fulfillment, I think for me. And um, I think I, the only like hint I took from it was um, I want, I wanted him to be able to cross group boundaries, like the punks like him and the jocks like him and the queers like him. And like, that was my, so in my mind, I was trying to make him kind of bro -y, but queer. And um, so I think when I went in, I just was, that was my main intention. And I just felt like um, really excited. I just was really excited to be um, doing something that I hadn't seen a lot of on television. Carter, I mean, you guys were on MTV. Teen Wolf was huge at the time. They were very trendy, but did you have lines that you couldn't cross? Did they set any boundaries for you guys? Cause you did explore so much, which we'll get to, but there was constantly issues and all sorts of things discussed in the show, but were there boundaries that you couldn't cross or did you kind of push through all those? You know, we um, honestly, no, we, uh, MTV was a really amazing partner in that way. The one thing they did was they, the storyline we did in season three with um, Elliot Fletcher and his character dating Shane and, and exploring sort of the, his trans experience was something we wanted to do in season two, but they were like, you've just introduced Lauren as intersex, maybe wait a beat, and we'll do that one in season three. Yeah. So, you know, at the time I was like, ah, I don't want to do it now, but we got to, we got to tell that as well. I think my, my main regret with the show, I wish we had had one more season to sort of properly end it. Um, I still, yeah. you know, I still have a lot of like, oh, what, what we could have done. Um, but but I can't fault MTV for being a supportive with the content of the show, for sure. Yeah. And and you brought up Lauren, um, her, her storyline. I remember doing interviews with you and with Bailey and educating myself on what intersex was and what that meant. And we're going to bring on right now Kimberly Zieselman, who's the executive director of Interact, which advocates for intersex youth. Hi, Kimberly. Hey, everyone. Great to be here. Hey. So, okay. Carter, for... Carter, first talk about just the origins of the story and then when you did kind of hook up with the Interact folks to make sure you were telling the story right. Sure. Well, first of all, I just want to give a shout out to Bailey. She couldn't join us today, but we all uh, send our love out to her. She could be here with us. Um, and we knew because the show was faking it, called faking it, we kind of knew everyone needed a secret, something that, you know, so, um, you know, Greg Sulk and Liam had this weird family that we explored and, you know, everybody needed something to, to flesh them out. And we knew we needed something for Lauren that would be a reason why she had her walls up and why she would be kind of this conservative, you know, standout in this liberal bubble we created. And um, we came across the idea of making her intersex, but we didn't really know what that was. You know, we it, we brought it up in the writer's room, but we were all like, we're not really sure what this means. And we contacted GLAD and GLAD put us in touch with Kimberly and Interact. And um, we had our first, I'll never forget, we had our first uh, conference call and we were saying, Kimberly, can you share with us what, what being intersex means and what is it? And, and what, are, what are some of the experiences that intersex people have? And as she was sharing her experience, we were just like, check, check, check. This all works so well for Lauren. 
And Kimberly was very excited because there have been no intersex narratives that have really lasted beyond like a, an episode of television, you know, and, and no character that we've got to tr gotten to, to sort of track their experience being intersex. So um, anyway, I won't speak for you, Kimberly, but that's how we, we came into, and Kimberly's become a good, very close friend of mine. And okay. I do her. And, uh, and we're getting more intersex narratives on TV, it's happening. That's so. great. So Kimberly, what was the most important thing for you to make sure it was conveyed in the story and in the character? Well, you know, first of all, just just hearing from Carter and the writers about wanting to have a recurring intersex character and and doing it in an authentic and sensitive way was just so heartwarming and not the way it usually goes. Um, so kudos to Carter and his team. Uh, you know, I myself am intersex and about 2% of the population is born intersex, which is really the same as natural redheads or people with green eyes. But because our community suffers from what I call this epidemic of invisibility, not only are intersex kids often erased by doctors as surgically erased by doctors as children, but also historically we've been missing from books and film and TV. And I will never forget watching the episodes. You know, I, I helped a little bit in some of our intersex youth as that's a part of Interax group helped, um, you know, edit scripts and review things and, and give advice. Honestly, we didn't have to do that much. The writers were fantastic. They heard it and they got it the first time, but I'll never forget watching somebody like me on TV for the first time. So like you were referring to, right? As a young gay man, um, it really was for myself and for so many intersex people. And I heard from many of them of all ages um, and particularly young people who are just on the cusp of like, feeling like they want to be out and proud and authentic, but still living in this world where they look around and they don't see anybody like them. So I can't say enough of, of what a milestone, a historic milestone faking it was for the intersex community and for intersex representation. I remember talking to Bailey during that time and she was so on board and wanted to know as much as she could. Yeah. But Carter, how, how did you work with her through that to play a lot of those scenes? Because they're sensitive scenes, but you guys treat it with such respect, which you did across the board with everything. But go ahead and talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, we um, very early on, and this was in, in season one, uh, we really came out with several other intersex people that we had at our writer's room. We spoke for the day. We had breakfast with Bailey so she could meet them and create a relationship with them so she could reach out with any questions she had as we were working through the scripts. And um, and I got to say, Bailey, you know, in terms of an, an actor who like, she signed up for the role and had no idea mid season one, I was like, okay, here's where we're going with it. And she was <laughs> like, I'm on board 100%. I get this. I'm we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna change the world. And, uh, and she, she never once had any hesitation about diving headfirst into that role. And, and it's so great because re-watching the pilot a couple of days ago, you just think, oh, she's the mean girl mm -hmm. and that, that's who she's going to be. But just introducing that made her, gave her so many other layers and really educated the audience too. Um, we, we, Kimberly and I were on pins and needles. We all were on pins and needles that first season because we hadn't gotten picked up. And we were like, oh, please let us get picked up after these eight episodes. and. MTV had told us like we're we we are into the intersex storyline, but let's introduce it at the beginning of season two. Okay. And so we had done all this planning and we laid all these like kind of hints, but we didn't know if we'd get to tell it until uh, the show got picked up. Okay, Kimberly, how how has it been in the land of television as far as intersex stories and characters? Have have you seen more, or is it at least getting better? Unfortunately, no, I haven't seen more since faking it. What I can say though, is there are currently several, several things percolating, which is great. Um, nothing that I'm aware of has aired and, you know, since faking it with an intersex recurring character, but there's increased interest. And I, I know of a couple of um, TV projects in development now, one that's actually filming that has an intersex recurring character. So, you know, it's starting to happen. Um, and we're 
we're going to see that it keeps happening. Good. I, I always say to people, if you don't see the stories about you on TV, write them yourself if you can, or find a writer friend and tell them your stories and get them out there because it's such a memorable part of faking it. When you think to all the major stories, that's always one of the first ones that comes up because it was so important. So thank you guys for doing that. And go ahead, Carter. Kimberly, a big plug. She wrote a memoir called XOXY about her own story. Nice. Uh, real Amazing. Love finding her intersex identity and it is powerful so everyone thanks, Carter. Bye. I love it well Kimberly thanks for the work that you do and keep up the good work and everybody look for her memoir thank you thanks, all Kimberly. right thanks for joining us bye, bye everybody bye thank you um, I want to go back we you guys talked about labels a little bit and I remember that also being a big part of the show because once Amy realizes she's in love with karma you kind of assume, oh, she's a lesbian. And it's talked about on the show, you guys put in a lot of the dialogue, but the labeling thing was a big deal with the writer's room and the characters. Can you talk about that a little bit and why that was so important not to just put her in a box as a lesbian or even saying that? Yeah. Well, I think we, Rita and I talked many times about like, this was a character going on a journey and we wanted to give her the time to go on that journey. and. You know, it, it, I know that it frustrated people. The thing about queer TV is we, there's not enough of it that we don't project our stuff onto it. And so I knew that like for every, for every woman who identified as a lesbian and wanted Amy to take that la label, there was probably another girl who identified as bisexual or just felt that they were also attracted to women who didn't have a label, you know? So we were in a space where the character really was trying to find herself and we wanted to let her be in that space. And I think for a lot of fans, they were like eager for to claim Amy. You know, there's a lot of people who wanted her to kind of land where they were. And, um, and you know, but I love our fans and they, they stuck with the show and they yelled at me when they weren't happy with me. the choices she made. And maybe- that, that, word, that word bisexual, it's a- it was a tricky word. I remember it being, you know, I, I experienced that from the fans just directly of, and not in a, you know, a, a really a mean way or anything. I think it's, it's exactly what Carter said. I think there's a, there's a deficit of these characters. So when you, you know, even remotely label someone as a lesbian, it's like, okay, great. You know, this is, this is me. This is who I am. And as soon as you kind of stray away from that it's well wait I thought you were this and now you're not and are they just doing that because they have to you know make everyone happy and and you know it was it was tricky and but I think it's that I think for the most part um people really resonated with her I mean I cannot tell you how many girls came up to me and said hey I came out while watching your show or you know I came out to my parents for the first time while while watching this episode and um, I think moments like that kind of made every everything else, you know, put everything into perspective. Because you couldn't make a hundred percent of of people happy, but ninety nine percent is pretty damn good. So you know, like I'll take it. Yeah, Kate, Katie, what were you hearing from fans? Because Karma didn't have the sexual identity story, but there was definitely a lot going on in her life as well. But what what did you hear from fans about her character and what she was doing? Yeah, I mean, I think that for a little while, I, I got a lot of the fans who were, you know, upset that Karma was hurting Amy. And there were a lot of times where <laughs> me as Katie, I was like so sensitive to it. And I would have conversations with Carter. And, you know, I knew that it was just like a part of the storyline that had to happen. But, you know, I also had a lot of people resonate with Karma being that you know, she didn't, she also didn't know how to label herself. We had so many scenes like the scene in the pool where she's drunk, but she kisses Amy and you see that there are actual feelings there, but she's scared of them. She doesn't really know what they mean. And so I think that that's something that a lot of people resonated with. And, you know, even to this day, I still get people that say that the show is their favorite show and, you know, how they felt so represented by everybody on the show. Um, but, you know, the writers were so smart in terms of, like Carter said, giving every single person something that was a secret. And I think that 
even though it, it wasn't as prominent as, as Amy's journey in terms of finding her sexuality, I think that karma was also trying to find that in a different way um, than Amy. And Michael, what were you hearing from fans? Or did you get marriage proposals? What were you, what were you hearing from the guys out there? Or the gals too? Um, I don't, I think people liked it. I got a lot of love. I feel like people were always really like respectful, which I really appreciated. <laughs> there was no, nothing crazy or inappropriate. So that's good. But, um, I was sorry, I, I'm a little distracted because I was thinking about how Shane's uh, like his, what it was, what was his secret? And I was thinking about his journey and I was like, oh, he like had the illusion that he was so free and like whatever goes and then yet realized that he was rigid in his own beliefs about sexuality and orientation and such. So I think that that was kind of fun. But um, yeah, I think people really liked it. I remember people complaining a couple times just because it didn't go where they wanted it to go and or, or that we weren't perfect. I think that that was a big one that we like our characters weren't doing the right thing all the time. Like we weren't valiant or righteous. And I think that that's not interesting and that's not human. Like people don't just do the right things all the time. And um, so I thought that was fun to play like the, the, the bad parts or like this, you know, the ugly parts of being human. Like, I think that that was really fun. Especially playing high school. High school is such a messy time, but I think that that was something that as you get older and, you know, we're all in our late twenties, early thirties now. It's, it's interesting that like, you realize that like, wow, okay. Your teens and your like formative years are messy for one reason, but like that mess doesn't stop. It just like changes into a different new mess. So that's why right. like people who watch the show, you know, so many people would come up to me and be like, you know, I'm not really the demographic. And I always was like, I don't really think there is a demographic for this. I think that this right. is, universal like messiness and messing up and not tying those things in like a pretty little bow like like Michael said is human and I think is really relatable for people of all ages yeah, but... and just because it takes place in high school doesn't limit the themes and the morals and this I mean I think we all realize that everywhere you go there's some like high school dynamic playing out <laughs> Yeah. Well, to be honest, by the time by the third season, it was like they were all twenty somethings. There was <laughs> and Lauren had her own apartment that Liam was living. In. Was like, Three ways. They were flying on private jets. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're gonna bring some other cast members on in a second. But Carter, I wanted to ask you, just going off on that part of the conversation, how how did you manage all the expectations? Because this show came out when Twitter was really becoming a thing and people could comment on things the minutes things were airing how did you kind of navigate trying to keep everybody happy but also just trying to tell your story and what you and the writers were trying to do it was it i think it would be more challenging now quite honestly i do i do think we kind of um uh, debuted at a time before uh, i think probably our original premise would have been like blasted out before the show even aired i think it, it was it was a challenging premise and i knew that we all knew it would kind of get attention um but what i think was great about the show was because there was so much um there was so much representation it bought us the ability to tell a lot of messy stories it didn't have to be perfect because everyone knew the show had so much rep representation going on and i think that that is the difference between token representation where it has to be perfect because it's the only queer character, the only, you know, only person from, from a minority group, you, you need to tell that story perfectly and you have a lot more, but because we had so many shades of representation in the show, I think it enabled us to have messier characters and it was a lot more, I, I know for, for me and the writers and the actors, I think we, we were able to kind of dig in and in a fun, in deeper ways. Well, and season two gave you a much broader scope because you had more episodes and you're able to introduce some new characters. And we have a couple of them here today. First up, we'll bring on Keith Powers who played Theo. Yay, Keith. There he is. What's up, y'all? And we also have Yvette Monreal who played Reagan. 
so it's, Carter, first talk about season two a little bit because you could open things up a little more because the, the you know the show's established, you know who the characters are, but then you can really bring in these new characters. How did you go about doing that? Well, we knew sec second season, we needed some good love interests and these two came on and delivered in huge ways. And um, I still remember both Keith and Yvette's chemistry reads uh, oh. and they were, they were so good. Um, but, you know, first we wanted to give Lauren, uh, we wanted to bring a new character in that could be sort of someone Lauren could be interested in so we could see a different side of her. And just as we were learning that she was intersex, it would complicate kind of her, her relationship life. And that's where Theo came in. Um, and then for, uh, we knew we needed to give Amy a character she could really invest in so that she could explore her attraction to women and how that would then upset karma. And, um, and Yvette came along and both, both roles, we were like, we've got to get these right. We got to get the right chemistry. And uh, I was so happy that, that it worked so well. And um, we were, we were sad that they ever had to leave the show. <laughs> well, Yvette talk about playing Reagan and connecting with Amy, because it was, it was a really nice chemistry on screen, but how do you, I, I don't know if you can create that or if it's Aww. just there, but can you talk about working with Rita? Yeah, I remember. It's so funny, uh, Katie, you said something similar to how I was feeling. Uh, there was like 14, it felt like 14 girls I was testing against at the final round. And I was like, oh my gosh, I get it. You're, you know, you're trying to get it right. But um, I remember going in with Rita and she was there. And I remember like at the end of one of the the sides it said that we had a kiss and I was like oh my gosh Rita like how do you feel about that you're like if it happens it happens do you remember <laughs> saying that and I was like oh my god is it gonna happen yeah so <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so the, we did the sides. If and, it happens, and, it happens. Uh, <laughs> that was pressure. Don't ever say yeah. that. To <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was, it, oh no, happen. I thought I was going to feel better. I don't know. I was all new to me. Frida's <laughs> like, like, what if it doesn't happen? Frida's <laughs> like, if I'm into you, I'll make out with you. <laughs> Wait, I'm like, she's into me or not. I get down. So. Um, no, but the it, luckily it went really smooth and it I happened. felt really comfortable with her. People were laughing. Yeah, it happened. It ended up happening, by the way. And I remember the I was like this. being like, did you get that? <laughs> Not with everyone. Oh, because that's if what I could have been a fly on the everyone. wall. Right, Rita? You didn't kiss everyone, right? No. I don't think so. <laughs> it was meant to be. It felt like something I would do. <laughs> no, I didn't. I was, I, I think I just, I, I wanted, you know, and this is, I think everyone, we were so, the show was so near and dear to us that I think we all just wanted to give our best and do our best. And, and all of these chemistry reads were an extension of that. And Yvette is just, I mean, she's just the kindest, cutest thing. And I, I miss you, girl, I love you. She really is just the kindest human. As I was saying, yeah, Carter was just really kind and he pulled me into the room once I booked the role and talked about the changes we were gonna make and talked a little bit about the character and what she means to Amy and everything. And he was just the sweetest person. So I was really, I felt so lucky. It was one of my first roles and I had, nerves going and I felt pressure, but it was really fun and fast paced. And, and these people right here made it so much more fun. So, so Yvette, yeah. since every character has to have a secret on faking it, what was your character's secret? Remind us. Well, I just feel like she was, she was a bad, she was a bad, in, well, I don't Reagan's know if I had, did I have a secret? Reagan's secret was really that her Sorry. ex had, had left her for a guy. And that, you know, that kind of came uh, out later and then it complicated her relationship with. That's, with what, I, uh, yes, that's what I remember. Okay. I remember that's where my trust issues led with Amy's, with Rita's character, Amy. And I was getting so jealous. I remember because of the whole thing with Greg. Now it's coming back to me, but yeah. I remember, 
I remember the episode we did where we were both cater waiters and your ex was like the bartender or whatever. And then we were like, let's both get back at them. And I'm like, I gave her a non-vegan egg roll and you like roofied Greg's drink. (laughs) I know. That's the thing with my character too. I remember um, she was always doing these things. She was like roofing these drinks and like, she's trying to team up with you to get revenge. And, but I always just like, I don't know. I never saw what she did as like a bad thing. I was just like, she's just having fun. You know, she's just, I try to just find the good in everything she did. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like stereotypical bad girl, you know? Okay. Okay. And then um, of course, Keith also came on as a love interest for Lauren also Mm -hmm. had a pretty big secret, which unfolded throughout the season. Um, but Carter, talk about first just casting Keith and the character for Lauren, because it'd be inter- you know we were wondering who she'd be paired up with, and they were a good match. But talk about just kind of shaping that character a little bit. Yeah, like at first we were kind of envisioning someone who was more like libertarian in their uh, in their viewpoints, like someone who would come in and maybe kind of be on board with Lauren's political views, but not really, and 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 then. Um, when we started doing the the auditions, I was we were all really drawn to Keith. He just had this like warmth and this charisma, and we were like, let's make him more, let's make him funnier and more, you know, just really kind of wrote more towards Keith. And um, we knew that we wanted him to eventually be a narc, like a uh, that <laughs> as as spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> And so that was also back in our heads. We were like, I mean, and if you remember the episode where that is revealed, like, I'm not sure if anyone has ever looked better in like a SWAT vest and <laughs> get a car. Like, Hello. It worked quite Hello. well. We were like, yeah. Um, but, but he, one thing that we just thought was so interesting too was he, he and uh, Bailey had instant chemistry, even though the fact that she was like tiny and he was super tall, like, <laughs> It, it just it worked it also made us chuckle and um and you know the two of them really brought alive this kind of ridiculous like romance of a narc <laughs> girl in high school like it's it doesn't funny. make a lot of sense if you think about it but they made it work it was uh, it was funny don't that, think about it it's funny that you brought up the height difference because i remember when we had to shoot the scene um i think it was when i like went to boxing like Theo went, went to do like a boxing class. And I remember um, uh, 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 Lauren, Lauren uh, goes to kiss Theo in the boxing room. And I think I remember you making her like stand up on something and kiss me. And I thought that was super funny, but it was dope. Like <laughs> it was such a dope thing. And I remember, I remember doing it. And at the time, like I was so green that I remember, I remember Bailey was married in real life. And I remember just feeling nervous, like, man, I just hope I just, you know, don't come off disrespectful to her husband. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just me being super green. I was like, dude, like, I was really nervous that day about that kiss. But I think, I swear, when you guys made her stand up, I think it was the bench, when you guys made her stand up on the bench, that loosened up everything for me because it reminded me that, like, that was one thing about faking it that I really loved and I really miss is how fun and open the set was. You know what I'm saying? And you just, you guys always made me feel like I was at home. From the moment I came in and did the audition with Greg, like you guys took me in with open arms. I couldn't, like at the time I was like, I was like, okay, I I really think I got a shot. Like it felt like that was like a good room, but in the back of my head, I was also like, you know, my anxiety, I was just like, nah, it's no way. It's no way. That just seemed like too good to be true. And (laughs) I just remember just feeling like, man, you guys took me in with open arms and like like you said, the Theo and the um the Lauren relationship was really like it was super complicated because that at the time I was super young and just that was I was introduced to inter like intersex in general on the show. Like I was being educated so much on the show and like coming from where I came from and just growing up, I was ignorant to a lot of things and you guys taught me so much and that relationship was so complicated. And it helped me just learn just off screen. I remember just doing a lot of Googling and just a lot of researching. And I was just like, man, this is like super dope. The representation was like out of this world, but um, it was complicated. And then you find out he's a narc and then it's like, wait, how 
Theo. Like that was the thing. It was like, yo, yes. what's going on? <laughs> like, I, it was just so many things, but man, it was just, I mean, that's what made it so fun. And it, it was like so spontaneous coming to work because you just never knew what was coming up. Well, you know, originally we, like, we were not going to keep Theo past the reveal that he was an art. Like we were, mm -hmm. we were just going to have him like go away, but we all were so in love with him that we were like, we got to figure out how to, this can yeah. still fall out. And it is kind of a creepy storyline. Like, I don't know. If it, is, <laughs> it is a good example of how like a show really like it evolves. It changes mm -hmm. based on, on the people involved. Like it isn't just me. It's not just the writers. It's like we were all coming up with it together and it was mm -hmm. really special. In my mind, he's like an 18-year-old narco, so it's like just on the cusp of being creepy, but not creepy yet. Right. Same, yeah. same, same, Katie, same, literally. That's what I used to say. I used to be like, he's like 18. He just graduated. Yeah. Like, <laughs> art, like, come on now. No, definitely. Keith, what was one of the things about um, just being intersex for Lauren's character that you, you didn't know about, that the show actually did tell you about? Can you think of anything in particular? Man, I, I can't personally... I can't right now think of anything in particular, but I remember there was words that we couldn't use. And I remember just, I literally crossed those out of my mind so much that I can't even remember the words right now. And I don't want to remember, but I just remember, <laughs> I remember when it, when it came to um, talking about someone who was intersex, I just remember there were certain words you couldn't use. And I remember just being like, oh, okay. Like, dang, I, I want to learn more. Um, but that, that's, that was the main thing that stuck with me because my whole thing was just about you know, I was ignorant to a lot of things and I was just like, I never want to, I never want to offend someone, you know, and, and offend someone because I am ignorant to what's going on in, you know, in their community, et cetera. So I think that was the, the thing that stood out to me most. And um, yeah, yeah. And I think, okay. you know, I think the show, um, why, while it, why I think it still kind of resonates and it's still super powerful is I do think it models a lot of the conversations and moments that people experience when they're dealing with, you know, these queer issues and, and, you know, it really helps people contextualize so that when they meet an intersex person or when they have a friend questioning their sexuality, they have a frame of reference that, that they can pull upon that, that, um, you know, that's what I'm proud of. I think that the show really did that for a lot of people. Well, and Michael, I wanted to ask you because Shane, Season two, he dates somebody who's in the closet, which was interesting to see Shane navigate. And then in season three, he dates Noah, who's trans, which is also something I hadn't seen, I don't think, at the time. Um, can you talk about both of those stories? And, you know, you playing the role and that maybe you learned some things, too, of, you know, that Shane was going through. Uh, Shane's love life is a revolving door. That is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he's, you know, he's hard to please. And he is actually a lot like me where like there's a lot of hairstyle changes and a lot of like chameleon, like he's very much like he'll wear a costume to this event because that's the character he's like embodying and stuff. And I think that sometimes that happened with his relationships where he kind of took on the person that he was dating in some yeah. way or shape or form and then sort of like outgrew them <laughs> until until noah and um because i think noah broke his brain a little bit a little bit he he showed him how he could be in a more vulnerable relationship and just be more authentic in general and um and I think that that was really fun to play. I, I think uh, it was it was fun to have a lot of different versions of Shane. You know, he's very um, multi-dimensional, which is rare, again, for a gay character. They're kind of like one note yeah. usually. And anyway, so yeah, but um, those relationships were very different and I think he learned a lot of different things in them. Yeah. Yeah. Car Carter, let's talk about Noah a little bit. Because I'm guessing, just like you talked to Kimberly at Interact, did you talk to Glad about portraying a trans character, or how did that go about? We we did. We connected with Nick Adams at Glad, and we um, he brought a panel of um, of trans youth over into our writers' room, who you know these were were 
trans kids who had been on puberty blockers and taking hormones. They were they were um, living life as their the gender that they identify, and they are they were so inspiring to me. And we were you know, and all the writers because we wanted to show a trans character that wasn't coming out that was living their life the way they wanted to, and how that complicates relationships versus a coming out narrative. It felt more authentic to faking its mission, which was kind of like, let's go beyond coming out stories and really kind of explore lives as queer people. So um, one, of the, one of the people on that panel that came into the writer's room was Elliot Fletcher, who, uh, you know, we, we really struggled at that point. There weren't many trans actors out there and Elliot had just graduated high school and uh, was in drama and came in and auditioned. Like we, I think we were his first audition. Um, and he just kind of blew us away with his abilities and, um, and kind of how he grew just on set. I could just see him getting better and better and better. And then he just left baking and went <laughs> and he has exploded now. But it was, it was a really, it was exciting, powerful storyline. And it really pushed our show. Like we, we hired um, Silas Howard to direct the episode where Elliot was introduced. Was he was a trans director, which was new for our cast. We we um, we put out an open casting call and got a lot of uh, trans background actors who came and were a part of our third season, so that we could have a more inclusive uh, just life at Hester High. And it, it really pushed us. You know, we were always trying to push ourselves to be as inclusive as possible. And I think um, I'm really proud of that storyline. Yeah, and I always credit baking it and talking to Elliot and a lot of you just, Elliot educated me as a journalist because at that time I was doing pretty much all LGBT press, but I, I didn't, hadn't interviewed a lot of trans people, but all of a sudden I was talking to Laverne Cox and I talked to Elliot and there was a lot and I was, and I would just ask, I would just say, hey, tell me how to do this correctly because I want to get it right. I want to use the pronouns correctly and understand all this. And Elliot was wonderful about it. He was so patient and just understood that I think he was happy people were asking the question. I'm sure he was happy you were doing the story on the show. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, so season three, unfortunately, was the end of the show. And I, I rewatched the finale because I couldn't remember if it kind of wrapped up or if there were cliffhangers. There definitely were some cliffhangers. So I'm guessing it was not expected. Is that correct? It was it was both expected and not expected. We okay. we knew we were on the bubble, and we tried to craft a a finale that could be a series finale if it had to be, but would leave the story open if it could continue. But when we shot it, we very much hoped that we would get another season. Um, so so that's why it's always felt a little incomplete, I think, for all of us. Yeah, it's safe to say you had ideas for season four. I think you mentioned earlier that you had some ideas. Yeah, we we really wanted to see Karma and like Karma come around and be like, maybe I made a mistake and Karma and Amy really explore like we love each other so much. Maybe this is the way it's supposed to go. And 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 I wanted to explore their like desire to make it work, but then realize that uh, it just didn't really fit and as much as they wanted it both to. Because I always felt like that would be the way that they could move on and really the thing i i always wanted the lodestar was i just never want carmen amy's friendship to to go away like i didn't want the end of the series to be carmen amy drift off in different directions like yeah. i wanted it to be like we get past this and we realize that our love for each other is never going to die um so i would have liked to have been able to kind of show that and i think um you know we were excited to tell kind of we were really building in Lauren and Liam, like I was excited to explore like these two characters in a relationship. We felt like they could really open each other up in interesting ways. And, yeah. and you know, I really wanted to see Shane kind of really, you know, we were excited to see where his his storyline with Noah went. So there were a lot of things that, that we didn't get to explore, but um, maybe one day. Should we ask them now? now? Should we what? Can we ask it out now? We have some of the sure. text. <laughs> yeah. Should we write a Make scene? Me, just send me the script. I know you yeah. have it. Yeah, it'll be all improvised. 
Katie and I had dinner. Remember that, Katie? And you were, this was like a little while ago. And Katie was like, you guys, you should just write it. You should just write it and we'll do it as like a table read. And I'm like, girl, I'm not, that is a lot of work to write that. <laughs> <laughs> no one is paying me. Pretty sure that was like, that was also probably like a glass or two of wine in. Yeah. <laughs> get it very passionate. So, you know what? This is a great idea. You know what? I think <laughs> you should do it. Just write it. <laughs> <laughs> well, th throughout the show, you guys had some great people guest star. I, I mentioned Laverne Cox. She was on the show. Mm -hmm. Fifth Harmony was on the show, which was fun. Yeah. yeah. Were, th were, those, were those people that came to you guys, like they knew the show and wanted to be on it? Or was it an MTV connection? Carter, how did that, how did some of those come about? Laverne was just inspired idea from our line producer. She said, oh, you know who'd be great for this? Laverne Cox. And she... She'd never been offered a role that wasn't a trans specific role. So she was super excited and she really brought it and made that episode so great. Um, and then um, uh, the Fifth Harmony thing was all MTV. Like I'd never heard of them. <laughs> so I had no, I, had no I, I was like, oh, okay. You know, I'm also, you know, I continue, I'm in my late forties and still writing things with teenagers in mind. So like, sometimes I have to be told what's cool. But they, were like, <laughs> they were like, they're coming. And who knew, who knew they, they were such a force, like. And it, well, and of course you, you had some singers in the cast, of course, Katie and Michael, and they did get to sing on the show. What Talk about bringing that into the show. Cause I remember I'd always ask Katie that. I'm like, are you gonna sing? Like, are they gonna let you sing soon? And you know, it's like season one questions, but talk about incorporating that into the show as, as naturally as you could. Uh, me? <laughs> oh, Katie or, Car or Carter? Don't make Katie, me. Katie, I'm sure you were, you were a game for it. Well, I, I mean, I was, yeah, I was totally game for it. But I remember Carter being like, we want you to like, like, he's like, I'm not a songwriter, but like, I want us to like write songs as if Karma's a songwriter. And like I at this point in my life was like writing songs all the time in Nashville where I had just moved and like, but then he, he was specific about the fact that he wanted them to be kind of hokey is not the right word, but like something that like a 15 year old girl who's like not that great at it would do. <laughs> um, so we had like a lot of fun with that. And then, you know, the moments that, I mean, one of my favorite moments is when me and Michael sang somebody to love and we're like battling it out on the stage and Michael's like covered in glitter with blue hair <laughs> but we always had such a fun time because we would then like get to like go in the studio together and just like have fun harmonizing and and doing all that so that was a that was a fond memory for them to let us do that and hey, Michael what do you remember about doing that on the show oh so many fun things I I'm a huge Queen fan. So I was like, so excited to be singing uh, Somebody to Love. And and then I didn't we do like a music? Yeah, the one Laverne was in, we did like a musical theater number where Bailey sang. Mm -hmm. And honestly, like everyone was great. Like who knew that like we could all sing? I kind of wish we would have pulled like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode and just done a full <laughs> musical, but. Rita's down. <laughs> Rita's nope. into it. That was always, I was like, I was like, in a, if we got another season, we would have done a musical episode and we would have like hired someone to play, to sing Rita's part and written it in somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> I was talking about it. Like, I actually agree. Did, I was like somebody wakes it. up and it's all a dream. You know, I'm a Buffy fan. The biggest, the biggest. That's you crazy. on set when um what was his name Nic nicholas brendan yeah nicholas brendan i just remember coming around the corner the day that he was on set and rita's like drinking something out of a straw just like this in front of video <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a cool moment for me that was a cool moment for me yeah oh man yeah. Well, you guys, this was so much fun. I know uh, people are still loving the show. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you still hear about it from everybody, but thanks for chatting with me today here at the 10th season of the ATX Television Festival. You guys faking it? Let's. Who knows? Reun reunions have come out of these reunions, so I'm down. Who knows? Carter's Carter, got writing to do. 
Carter, get, get to it. Tom, somebody write it now. I see it already. It's like ten years into the future. <laughs> yes. You know that. they're all like in their late twenties, and we just need to like see where they all are. <laughs> and maybe Karma realizes that she wants to be with Amy in her late twenties. Here. Yeah. No. Here, I'm gonna act it out with my body. <laughs> look how scared I look. Look at my eyes. <laughs> terrified. Oh my God, Amy, I was wrong. You were wrong. I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, it writes itself. It writes itself. Y'all want to see? Thank okay. you, Jim. It does. On it that, on that note, we'll wrap it up. But thank you so much, you guys. Great to thank see you, you all again. I love you all. Thanks, ATX. Hey, guys. Hey, Fading and fans. It's Sophia Ali. I just wanted to pop in and say that I am so bummed I couldn't be there today. I got called into work really last minute, and I wish that I could be there for this glorious reunion, but have a good time without me. I love you guys.